question comes from Ricardo. Ricardo, your line. Yeah, Ricardo, Al Ricardo Alonso Zaldivar with AP. And I wanted to ask you about the, um, there's a provision of the, of the finance bill that's called the free rider uh, provision, whereby companies that uh, don't offer coverage would have to uh, basically cover the subsidies of any of their employees who wind up getting uh, federally subsidized care through the exchange. Uh, what's your take on that? Is that acceptable to the BRT? And isn't it potentially costlier than an employer mandate? Um, Ricardo, uh, that's a good question. Um, what the committee is dealing with and struggling with is how do you come up with a more efficient system uh, than a, an employer mandate? And our concerns about of an employer mandate is that, again, we lose flexibility or are that we lose flexibility that you define specifically what would have to be in, an, uh, in a, uh, a program, and two, that it's not workable for a, another very large group of people who we need to get into the insured uh, product system, and that is uh, the small business people. Um, what the Senate Finance Committee has attempted to do is find a less objectionable way to um, uh, require or keep employers doing what they're doing. Remember, 160 million Americans get their uh, health insurance at their job site. So we think you know, they, that they have the challenge of making sure that it doesn't incentivize employers to give up their coverage, but it doesn't overly penalize those that can't afford coverage. Um, what we know about free rider at this point, we don't know everything. It's not all set in, in the details, but we know that the direction they're going, and we think it could be it worked out to be acceptable for us. Um, there's some criticism of it on the left that it would um, – you know, basically uh, penalize the hiring of um, of, of single moms, uh, minorities, people who tend to be in lower paid uh, lower paid jobs, and you could see on the face of it would be candidates for getting coverage, subsidized coverage. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I can. I saw that yesterday. Uh, there was a group that came out with that allegation, and quite frankly, um, I thought it was um, not true. Quite frankly. Uh, again, when you look at employers like the business roundtable companies, uh, we provide health care for everybody. We don't, we, every one of our employees and their families, so you, you, you don't care what their income level or what their marital status is or uh, where they live or, or, or what they do. They get health care coverage. We need that because we know that, that uh, workers and their families that have good health care coverage are more productive, more capable workers, and that's what we need to be competitive. So the, fa the, the allegation that that would somehow cause us to discriminate against people um, uh, because of its existence, uh, I think, quite frankly, is, is uh, ill-founded and, and uh, very difficult for me to understand the logic behind it. It runs counter to what we want uh, for our uh, employees and what we want out of our workforce. The other thing is, is that the, the, um, uh, the, the cost, uh, which is the issue that we're facing, um, uh, is born uh, as a risk pool for the whole of our employee base and their families. And the entrance of, of small percentages of people, no matter what they look like, whether they be uh, elderly or young, male or female uh, from Wisconsin uh, or uh, from Florida, don't affect our costs. Uh, that large. We have large enough pools. Uh, so uh, the argument, uh, quite frankly, doesn't ring true from, from our perspective. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question comes from Matt. Matt, your line is open. Hi. Uh, thanks, guys. This is Matt Tobias with Modern Healthcare. Uh, and, and and actually, uh, Ricardo asked a question I was going to ask, but uh, just to follow on on that, I, John, I was wondering, you know, we've seen in recent weeks, we've seen uh, the hospitals, the pharmaceutical industry uh, come forward and kind of announce these deals that they have made with the uh, Senate Finance Committee and the White House, and I was wondering if the Business Roundtable has had any kind of deal with those guys, uh, you know, with the committees that have jurisdiction and with the White House. And also, generally, what is... Uh, the plan moving forward for uh, the advertising campaigns that you have? Sure. Um, uh, Matt, uh, we look at this perspective, uh, we look at this from the perspective of payers. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So the deal we have uh, with the White House and the Congress is we keep encouraging them to get this right. Um, uh, you know, we are already paying. Um, as I mentioned, the roundtable companies provide coverage for 35 million Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to continue to provide that coverage, but clearly we have to bend the cost curve um, yeah, if we're going to be able to do it and be able to be competitive uh, in an international marketplace where we're competing against companies that, that have different models, that don't bear the cost, or the cost is yeah. borne by the entire uh, country. So um, we, are, um, uh, we, we are not the logical place to go and, and, and try to get a, 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 a contribution to the cost because we're the payers. The, uh, in terms of advertising and, and support, uh, what we're doing is we're meeting with as many uh, and communicating with as many members of Congress uh, and with the administration uh, daily. Um, we're doing it uh, throughout the recess uh, with two messages, and that those two messages are keep doing it and get it right. Um, we've communicated with, with Republican senators, uh, urging them to, to continue to stay part of the process. Uh, we've given our concerns to the House members. Democratic senators, we've given our concerns uh, to the White House. We continue to have those discussions, but rather than do any advertising as the business roundtable, what we're spending our time and our efforts doing are bringing the expertise that we have uh, as payers um, uh, and the economic argument uh, as payers to those people who are uh, involved in it. Thank you, sir. Next question comes from Donna. Donna, your line is open. Hi, um, this is Donna Smith at Reuters calling. Um, Hi, Donna. I'm um, just wondering, um, the uh, Senate Finance Committee obviously is looking at this Cadillac plan. They call it a fee. Others would call it a tax on these Cadillac insurance plans. Um, do you have any concerns about that way of raising the revenues? You know, uh, we have always been supportive of looking at the revenues, uh, uh, whatever revenues are needed, from within the health care system, and that's a message that we've consistently given. We are very much concerned that, uh, for example, in the House bills, uh, that if you go outside of the health care system and you use that to support what is a fundamentally broken system, you don't get the kind of innovation and reforms that, that you want. We believe um, everything we know about uh, productivity, innovation, everything we know about wellness and prevention causes us to believe that there is considerable savings to be gotten from the system itself, from the healthcare delivery system. Um, we understand that, that uh, uh, the unique rules of the Congressional Budget Office and, and scoring uh, within the Congressional process can't fully reflect those uh, uh, savings. Uh, so as they look for additional revenues to, to cover those people who cannot afford uh, their own health care, um, they cannot afford insurance, we're encouraging them to look within the system. The details of the so-called Cadillac plan um, are, are still yet to be completely fleshed out. The good news is they're, they're looking within the system. Uh, the test will be does it have the, the right results within the system? Does it, does it motivate the right behavior? And have you analyzed that yet? Uh, without knowing the complete details, we, we, we haven't been able to do that. We've, we've looked at it generally. We've looked at those kinds of approaches generally, and we think if the numbers are set at the right level, they recognize the realities of, of, um, uh, of uh, inflation within the health care system, that it could have some beneficial impact um, as uh, employees, as, as all of us become more aware of what the real cost of the system is, and have more incentives to innovate and, and uh, try to drive those cost curves down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 